And our last presentation is going to be um, from Tamara Hodgins from RCMP, and she will be talking about PDQ. Hello. I think I've met most of our PDQ users, and for those of you who I haven't met yet, uh, if you are here, I would love to meet you. Um, we're trying to touch base with all of our PDQ partners um, at all of these events. Um, just to give you an update on PDQ and where we're at this year, um, I just want to start off by saying that last year we had what we called an amnesty year. And so we said start again in 2010, and this was a huge success. So thank you to all of our partners for their continued efforts and support. We did find we got samples from a lot of people that we had not heard of or heard from for many years. So sample submissions from our U.S. partners alone more than tripled in 2010 for our best year ever. So thanks to all of those sample submissions and our hardworking students that we had, we were able to add over 1,000 samples to the database for the 2010 release and have an additional 1,300 plus samples and counting for the 2011 release. I'd just like to take a minute to mention some of our top three U.S. contributors. Um, I'd like to say thank you to South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Uh, they contributed 256 samples alone last year for 2010. Also, the Kentucky State Police Central Lab, uh, they contributed 225 samples. And the Oregon State Police, they have two sites in Portland and Springfield. Together, they submitted 142 samples. So thank you. So we were doing so good, I just want to know, where did everybody go? <laughs> um, these are the samples submitted by U.S. partners. So we are still getting samples from our U.S. partners. Um, and it is still early in the year. And I know that many of you do like to collect your samples over the summer. And that's when you have your help and you have a little bit more time. Uh, but to give you an idea, these are the samples submitted from 2001 to 2011. So for this year, we have up to 760, I believe, from our U.S. partners. So we're still doing really well, so I still want to thank you. And for those of you who plan on returning and collecting your samples and submitting them, we look forward to getting them. Just to give you an idea, um, from 2006 to 2011, these are the numbers. And I apologize, I don't have the Singapore um, numbers in this table. Um, but we do get samples from them regularly as well. So. You can see that we are getting um, quite a bit of samples this year, but 2010 was our best year ever. So samples submitted since 2006, we have 9,657 samples. So that's a large amount of samples, and the amount of samples we have waiting analysis is 5,800 samples. So I need to get home and get back to work. <laughs> The samples that we've added to the database from 2006 to present, um, typically we've had a 500 sample amount as our goal for every year. We wanted to analyze and, sub and add at least 500 samples to the database every year. As you can see, in 2010, we added over 1,000 samples, and our goal for this year is to have 1,500. As for our PDQ staff, uh, currently there's myself, as well as we have one full-time university student who started with us last month. And we are hoping to soon fill one vacant position that we have, and we have another university student who will hopefully be with us very shortly. Some of our PDQ goals, uh, we really want to increase the number of newer samples entered into PDQ. And the way we've been focusing the samples, uh, we would like to take the 2007 to 2011 samples and analyze those. So if you're submitting samples to us, what we do is we go through and we pick those samples that would best benefit the database. So we're not processing your samples as a batch or as a whole. So in the past, we would analyze them as a batch, update your spreadsheet, and send them back to you. Um, and we have had questions about where these spreadsheets are, and it's because they're 
really not complete where just maybe choosing um, 10 samples out of your batch or 15 or 30 depending on the distribution of how many samples are newer samples and how many will fill holes in the database. So um, we are focusing on the newer samples. Once we have all of the 2007 samples to 2011 samples in-house processed and analyzed, then we go back and we start looking at the 2003 to 2006. So it creates a little bit more work for us, but we're hoping that this will build up the samples that we have in the database for the newer model years, and this will put us in a much better position three years and five years from now. So we're hoping to have 1,500 samples for the 2011 release of PDQ. Uh, I also want to start working on validating the samples. I know this has been on my list of things to do for probably the last um, 18 months, but um, it is still there. It has not fallen off my plate. As well as uh, newsletters, we like to add um, all any extra information for our partners and give everybody an update. It's one of the things we used to do in the past and we're starting to do a little bit more now. So um, if you have any information that you would like to see on the newsletter, by all means, you can, um, you can let us know. Um, and we have the PDQ partner stats and updated spreadsheets. Um, for those of you who I have not spoken to, um, we know how many samples you have submitted and we know if it has been 10 years since you've submitted samples. So um, don't think that it's, uh, that we haven't noticed. We do know and we have a spreadsheet of all of our partners, how many samples they've submitted for each year. So those numbers and that spreadsheet will be distributed with your next PDQ release and just so that everybody can see where we're standing. So um, I will also send out the updated spreadsheets for the samples that we have analyzed into PDQ and we've assigned a PDQ number. Um, we will put that on the spreadsheet, send that to you. For those of you who have not submitted samples in many years and would like an updated copy of your spreadsheet, please contact me and I will send it to you so that you can number your samples that you will be submitting in sequential order. I would just like to remind everybody of the agreements of non-disclosures that were sent out with the 2010 PDQ release. They were sent out on blue sheets and they need to be signed by your directors. This is an agreement between the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and your police agency and it basically says that you will not be distributing the database to any third parties. Um, if we do not get a signed copy this year, we cannot give you the 2011 release. So. I know that we have uh, many agreements from most of our PDQ partners. We do have a few that are still coming in. I know there are a few of you that contacted me that would like to drop them off here uh, during this week. Please find me if you do have some. Otherwise, um, please mail it to me. We do need the original copy. As for sample submissions, I'd just like to remind you that the 60 samples per year is your payment for the database. So we would like to see some samples. And please submit them in a coin size envelope um, and we would like them the size of a quarter. So there has been some, um, some beliefs that as long as they were shavings that added up to the size of a quarter then that was sufficient. But the way we're doing our sample technique we would like a large enough sample for a few reasons. We would like to have enough that we get clean, clean samples of each layer. We also like to have a little extra so that if you would like to do a physical comparison of a certain color make model year, you can always contact us and we will have enough that we can break off a piece and share that with you. Uh, the other thing, um, if you wouldn't mind, we would appreciate it if the samples weren't wrapped up in paper. Sometimes we get eight and a half by 11 envelopes with large paper um, and it just makes a little bit more work for Diana when she's opening up and splitting the samples. Um, as well as for ourselves. So some of the workshops we did this year, we did one at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in April in St. Paul, Minnesota. We also had a PDQ workshop at the Illinois State Police Forensic Science Center in Chicago. 
as well as we had one Monday and Tuesday here at the Trace Evidence Symposium. So I'd like to thank NIJ for inviting us to do a workshop and for Diana for all of her help in organizing it and helping me. So if you have any questions, comments, or PDQ stories that you would like to share, we would love to hear from you. Uh, we do appreciate any success stories that we can get, and if we are able to publish them in our PDQ newsletter or just share them with other people, that is fantastic, but please let us know. Uh, you can reach us at pdq at rcmp-grc.gc.ca. That is the email address that will go to um, the PDQ team. Or you can reach us toll free in North America, or we do have our international number there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. But that concludes our paint session. Um, now we'll open up the floor for any questions. And if you have a question, just please state your name and ask the presenters. Are there any questions? Um, because we've had a couple of cases lately um, that you have dealt with my coworker with where um, the paint, you, you determined that the paint actually came from bumpers and that you all don't have that information. Is one of your all's future goals maybe to have us collect not only from the body of the vehicle but also if it's a colored painted bumper to also collect that so that that database can be built up? Um, we have, we have mentioned to people that they can collect from various parts of the same vehicle and that would count as several samples. So if they wanted to collect a sample from the fender as well as one from the bumper or one from the grill, if they are different substrates and different paint systems, then they could submit them as different samples. So one vehicle, they could potentially get three samples. So we have asked for that. We do have many paint um, systems over plastic substrates. Unfortunately, um, we don't have a lot of information for the vehicles that are manufactured outside of North America. We do have some good contacts for the manufacturing companies um, here in North America. And it's difficult for us to tell whether or not some of these are refinished systems or original systems. And for those that we do decide are original systems, sometimes it is still dif difficult to differentiate between manufacturing plants. And the most we can suggest that it's um, possibly a, from a vehicle manufactured in North America, not necessarily a North American manufacturer, but coming out of a plant um, based on the chemistry of the paint. So uh, we do need more, more time to actually look at that because it is difficult to distinguish between plants on plastic substrates. Did you have anything to add? Okay. Go ahead. Good morning, I'm Chris Gates from the Oregon State Police Portland Lab. I have a question for Mr. Palanick. That was Robin study. Um, I understand your samples that you're building the library from are, are pure samples, so to speak, of those pigments. But you said that the binders, you didn't expect to have much Robin activity. Do you think with casework samples of vehicle paints or architectural paints that there would be enough data from the pigment coming through that you could use it for comparative purposes? And then second part, uh, we've got an FT Robin. Do you think that would also be useful in terms of uh, collecting similar data? So there were two questions. One was about FT Raman, and the other is, can the pigment reference spectra be applied to um, actual paint samples? Not necessarily the same pigment, but at least comparing to. Right. And so everything we've done shows that there is this: the the pigment data can be applied to paint samples. So before we did this work, we've looked at a a limited number, but enough paint samples that I'm confident that when you look at paint samples by Raman spectroscopy, you have a very good chance of seeing pigments. What's the evidentiary significance of that information? At this point, I don't know, because we didn't have enough reference spectra to address that question. But I think that you can, I know that you can definitely identify Raman spectra, or Raman, or you can identify pigments in paints. Um, so hopefully that answers your first question. Um, the second question with um, Fourier transform Raman spectroscopy, um, I know that it can be used. Um, I haven't compared the data. Ed can probably talk to, to that if it's directly comparable. 
Uh, FT can be used for paints. In fact, it seems to have somewhat of a broader spectrum as far as the paints because there's going to be less fluorescence. You're working with light further into the um, infrared region. The only thing about FT is because the intensity of your scattering goes as the fourth power of the peaks, you have to use uh, a higher power laser. And again, that's where you definitely want to start with lower powers. So it's sort of uh, good news and bad news. You generally will get better spectra. There's less fluorescence, but you also have a greater chance of burning holes through samples. I've burned samples that were white with an FT. Uh, if you have something called line excitation where you can spread the laser out, you're probably, no matter what type, you may get better results. Is there any other questions? Go ahead. I have a question also about the pigment as well. Um, at some point, there was talk about Microtrace actually publishing a book of reference Raman spectra. So in addition to the scheme, we could also actually see the spectra of these reference materials and compare those with ours. Is, is there progress in that? Is that in the future? Sure. The question was, are the reference spectra going to be available, essentially? And the answer is yes, and hopefully in two ways. Um, in the first way, um, which will be hopefully in a few months, the NIJ report will be available for download from their website. Um, I don't know the website name, but um, I'm sure that it won't be hard to find. And that is going to include some text, as well as the classification scheme, as well as just the Raman reference spectra on their own with labeled peaks and information about how the sample is collected. And then the second answer to that is we are working on a, a book, actually, um, but time is limited to get that done. So that's a little bit further out and hopefully will be a little bit more extensive once we have a little more experience with this, or even more experience with this. Any other questions? I've got one. OK. <laughs> uh, this is for Diana. In the last set of SEM EDS spectra, it looked like I was seeing small levels of lead. And lead in a house paint would be significant for two reasons. One is there are very common dryers. They're used in low levels. But if you see it, it's more than likely an older paint. Mm -hmm. But they also used a wide variety of different elements, heavier elements, that we used to see. It, if you have an XRF attachment to your SEM, which I'm sure you can afford, we can't. But you'd, you'd probably see some of these other dryers, and they can be very useful for distinguishing uh, paints, but you, I'd look at that again and see that, like I said, that to me when I saw that, I thought this looks like a low level of lead. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Any questions? All right, well, then that'll be the end of it. I want to thank all the presenters for presenting, as well as thank you guys for attending. The lunchbox, as well as the poster session, will open at 12 15.